Hello, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Owen Robinson. And today we are discussing the Korean 8 body types and how it may be able to help you work out what the best diet is for you. So tell me, Owen, why did you want to discuss this topic today? Yeah, it's a good question. It's something that you and I have known about for, I think, 10 years, Chrissy. We were introduced to it by someone else. And I guess uh, a good question is, why do I want to talk about this when I have publicly, repeatedly, not just on this podcast, but all kinds of other podcasts, kind of ridiculed and demeaned all those systems out there that claim that you can eat based on a type? Because I usually say it's not as simple as that. Um, and I stand by that. Like, there are different genetics, like for instance, the idea of, oh, you're more of a fat burner or you're more of a carb burner. The truth is some people are really good at burning fat and carbs. Some people <laughs> struggle with both. Like it, life isn't always as simple as that. So why do I want to talk about this despite that? Um, because this system to me is very interesting. Um, so first of all, no one knows about it in the Western world, pretty much. I mean, obviously not no one, because there's me, <laughs> but I'll put it this way. Uh, when I try to research this, there's not a single YouTube video in English about this. Um, there's only one book in English, which was obviously very, mm, what's the word, amateurishly translated and probably hasn't had many readers. Um, there's a handful of articles written in English that mostly repeat the same thing between every between every website. So there's very little information available. Um, and yet I feel like this theory about how to eat deserves a wider audience. One of the things that's so interesting about it to me is that unlike most of the other systems out there, um, well, let, let's talk about it. So most of the systems out there are based on a couple of things. Either making very ge broad generalizations based on um, like a specific thing about you. Like for instance, uh, your blood type or maybe your body type, you know, are you an ectomorph or a mesomorph, all of that kind of stuff. So that's one type of system. And then the other system is, but other type of system out there is kind of based on, uh, like body typing system is based on information about you that I would say would be like fairly arbitrary, like based on your date of birth or, you know, like stuff like that, stuff that really honestly, probably like in a, in a rational universe really should have very little impact on what foods do and don't work for you. Um, and of course there are systems out there where the evaluation of what you are is based on kind of empirical observation. And I would say that, for instance, the Ayurvedic doshas would be an example of that, the Pitta, Kapha, Vata. And I would say that there's some credence to a system like that. The main, the main thing I do like about that system is I think it points out that there are certain tendencies that are shared in common between those types. For instance, there is a type that tends to be more inflamed and tends to be more agitated and irritated. Um, and they have certain tendencies and, you know, you could call that pitta type and there is a type that tends to be, uh, you know, have more of a buildup of phlegm and mucus and they do tend to be slower and uh, they do tend to be heavier and that kind of thing. And that's the kapha type, you know, like, etc. What I don't like about that system is basically like, what type of vegetarian are you? That's like in terms of the actual advice it gives you. Um, the, <laughs> like the pitta, kapha or vata, there is no type. Now, having said that, there are some individual practitioners who sometimes say, I think that the vata type might actually benefit with eating some meat or something like that. But generally, it's a very pro-vegetarian diet. So does this fit in with what science tells us about um, what works for... Every human being, no, not really. Now, again, I'm not saying that there are, are no human beings that might be better off without me. I actually think there are, but this is what this Korean eight body types addresses. And what's interesting about the eight Korean body types to me is, first of all, it is based on uh, something which is a physiological reality, which I'll get into in a second. So um, it's not based on perception of traits, 
uh, like I said, which usually is the best you can hope for. Um, second of all, it's actually quite a new system. So even though it's based on kind of like ancient, maybe TCM principles in terms of the language that it uses, it was actually developed less than 100 years ago. And so it kind of was developed hand in hand with modern medicine and science. Modern medicine and science already existed when this system was first developed. So there was kind of understanding about things that was just missing with a lot of these much older systems because they just didn't know a lot of stuff about the human body that we do now, if that makes sense. They thought, you know, like the spleen does all kinds of things that the actual spleen doesn't really do, for instance, you know, like stuff like that. Um, another thing that's really interesting about it is that there actually is a lot of scientific research into this. Obviously, not a lot of it is going on in, say, the US, but actually some of it is. Like I saw a large-scale study on this with uh, more than 100 participants over a long period of time in Germany. So, But as you can imagine, a lot of the research is going on mainly in East Asia, specifically Korea, but there is a lot of research. Third, uh, fourth, I'm not quite sure where I am. Uh, another, another point, <laughs> wherever I am, is that it's based on uh, constitution. So this is often referred to as either the eight body types. I'd call it the Korean eight body types to help to distinguish it from other things that may be the same. Um, or um, constitutional medicine. So the idea of constitution uh, is that it's something that you are born with. It's not something that changes. And so, like, that's, again, something that's different from Ayurveda, right? Ayurveda, yeah, maybe at one point you were kapha now you're vata or whatever that's something that will change depending on circumstance the idea of this body type is this is something you're born with and this is something that you'll die with this is not something that changes and also it's something that's hereditary meaning um if if you're if your mother is one type and your father is another type you will be one of those two types or possibly a variant of those two types not everyone 100 percent agrees on that but you'll never be a different type that neither your mother or your father are. It's it's always going to come from them. Um, also, what's interesting to me, fifth or six, um, is that, so, no, let's continue that, actually. Yeah, so there's a lot of research about it, and because it's meant to be constitutional, because it's meant to be something that you're, is hereditary, there's actually been a decent amount of research into whether there is evidence genetically that this is something that is passed on. And I'll send you a link to a study that I found, Chrissy, um, where they were investigating exactly the same thing that we do in Genetic Insights. They were investigating SNPs and they were saying, given that this type is supposed to have this quality, we'll talk about this in a minute, and this type is supposed to have this quality, they should have more of these SNPs and the other type should have more of these SNPs. And when they looked at it from a certain perspective, they couldn't find the correlation. But then when they looked in a different perspective, they saw the correlation quite strongly. So what I would say is... Um, there's not research that conclusively proves it, but there is enough research that indicates that they're onto something, even though maybe they haven't got everything right. And to be honest, that is my conclusion on the system full stop. The reason I'm sharing it with you is not because I recommend anyone stick to it religiously, unless it's simply you know, for research purposes and as an experiment, but because I think that it has some valuable insights about the way that we are, that I have not seen anywhere else. And so that's, you know, that's why I wanted to mention it. No one else is talking about it in the English language and it has things to say that nothing else that I've ever come across has to say that is helpful. So that's why I'm talking about it. Um, and then, yeah, the, the last point that I'll make on it is it really explains a lot why diet, diametrically opposite strategies to health and it's not only food they have recommendations for other stuff like uh you know is sauna and heat good for you or is cold uh, exposure good for you a breathing practice is good for you you know like various other things like that um why an approach that is literally invigorating and will bring someone back to life from like the brink of sickness and death will do the exact opposite to someone else. So a certain regime, like a carnivore diet, there's all kinds of people who are like, when I stopped eating plants and only started eating meat, everything went away. Like all my problems went away. My diabetes went away. My heart disease went away. My blood pressure normalized. I lost 50 pounds of weight. My autoimmune disease went away. All these people, right? But then there's other people who are like, 
when I stopped eating all animal foods and I started eating purely plants. <laughs> same thing, same list. My diabetes went away, my heart disease went away, I lost 50 pounds. Blah, blah, blah. And so rather than, you know, and I'm always in those kind of situations, rather than trying to work out who's right and who's wrong, rather than trying to work out who's lying and who's not, I mean, it's good to realise that people are lying, but I, I don't think that all of them could be lying. And I think at least some of them are telling the truth. And so how is that possible? If we human beings are all the same, and some people have theories about that, like, for instance, you know, on a carnival diet or a fruitarian diet, you're excluding a lot of processed food and chemicals, probably. You know, so that's true. And I realise there are other theories to explain how it could be the case. But still, you know, going to a diet that's entirely animal-based with, like, zero carbs versus going to a diet that's, like, you know, almost entirely carb-based with zero animal, like, that is still very different. And it's interesting that people could respond very positively sometimes to each intervention um for some people you know beef and eggs are like seem like a miracle medicine for others it's you know green juice and berries and it, it's just odd so this system gives a very interesting explanation as to why that's the case why people are different in this regard um and so that's the other reason i wanted to share it uh, i you know i'm working more and more people one-on-one -on -one at the moment and I'm just noticing how commonly people are just obviously on the wrong diet for them. And I see clues in their genetics. What are the clues that you're seeing? Because I know we do have the reports on each of the macros, but are there other things that you're seeing in these consultations with these individuals that brought you to that conclusion? Uh, yeah, I mean, the macros are definitely a start. Um, but I, I think I'll answer it more as we go through the types in the Korean body types and then please remember to ask me and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the uh, genetic like reports that I see that indicate it. Unfortunately, we don't have a genetic report for these Korean body types yet. We do actually have genetic reports for the three Ayurvedic types. Um, that's because even though there is, as I say, quite a lot of scientific research done into these eight Korean body types, it's still not as much as the, um, the Ayurvedic types. Uh, you know, India is just a larger company with a bigger population. They've done more research. Um, but the Korean type is quite popular, not only in Korea, but also in Japan. And so there is a fair bit of money behind it. And I wouldn't be surprised if it eventually catches up. And I would love at some point to be able to offer reports of, uh, of that as well that correlate with people. So sooner or later, um, hopefully that's something that we will have available. For, but for now, I'm just seeing those clues. And sometimes I'm making leaps, Chrissy, like intuitively, which I then still back up with facts and data, but often I'm starting to see signs early, oh, this, this person is this type. And then I start going through it and I'm like, oh, let me ask you questions. I, again, just because I think it doesn't mean it's true, so, and I'm not always right. Um, but you know, often I ask and I can just see this tendency again and again for people, and I tend to speak to people not who are like, oh, God, I can't stop drinking. I can't stop smoking. That's not the type of person I see. I see people who are like, I've been trying to be healthy for ages. Why is it not working? <laughs> it's like a more common thing. And so because of that, I, um, I, I see a lot of people who really are trying, but they're trying in the wrong direction. And that's why it's not working. And sometimes it's quite a hard pill for them to swallow. Like th this is, I know you've been, and it was a hard pill for me to swallow. I've, I've made this mistake um, I would say, and this, I say this not as a boast, but just as a fact, like I have stuck to specific regimes, I would say more rigorously probably than any person that I've ever met. Like if I decide I'm going to be 100% whatever, car you know, carnivore, vegan, paleo, keto, whatever it may be, sugar-free, gluten-free, I really do it 100%, like no cheating, no deviation, no nothing. And so I have made mistakes of really making myself worse, whereas a, 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 a maybe a less disciplined person would actually suffer less because they were, uh, even if their di the diet they're trying to stick to is in the wrong direction, they're not sticking to it religiously, so they're not doing themselves as much harm. Whereas if I choose a diet which is going in the wrong direction, I do myself more harm because I'm going 100% in that direction because I'm following the diet 100%. So if you're someone who's really struggled to stick with diets or health regimes in the past and have kind of thought that you are undisciplined or weak-willed actually you may just have been a bit more in tune with your body and a bit more sensible than i was so uh you know maybe that would be something that you realize while listening to this as well 
Beautiful. Well, thank you. That was quite an in-depth opening. So we, there's a lot to unpack there. And, you know, you're right. I mean, I, when we've both been down this path, it's it's quite interesting. So I'm really happy that you're bringing it to the forefront here today, because like you just said, you made a very, very good point. The people that are on their journey and they they think they're doing everything right. But it turns out that they are, even though it's a healthy food, but if it's not right for them or if it's causing that inflammation or if it's causing the spikes, they're not going to get the results that they want to get. So this could be one of those areas to look at to help them get to that deeper level uh, that could take them to that, their ultimate goal. Yeah. And and, and in part one of the Feel Younger Diet, I really, you know, show how to do that. But that's more like a manual labor. That's really working out one thing at a time, what does and doesn't agree with you, and then sticking with it. With this, you can start to notice patterns. Not that you have to stick to it rigorously, you know, this system or anything like that, but you can go, you know what? This disagrees with me, this disagrees with me. I wonder if all these other things disagree with me that you'd expect this type to have disagree with them. So you can kind of make that leap, and sometimes it can save you a lot of time and a lot of hassle and experimenting with things that don't work. Beautiful. Well said. Well, let's get into it. So can you go into detail? You know, what are the Korean eight body types? Okay. So before I introduce them, I really want to talk about the basis behind them. And so I want to talk about biochemical individuality. Isn't it crazy when you go to a doctor and whether they're giving you an antibiotic, an antihistamine, an anti-inflammatory, an antifungal, whatever it might be, lots of antis, um, anti-stomach acid, anti-acid. Whether you're a 100-pound female or a, that's for 4 foot 11 or a 300-pound male who's 6 foot 4, they give you the same dose. <laughs> now, yes, <laughs> usually, right? Like, usually, isn't that yeah. insane? It is. Now, now the argument could be, well, Owen, you know, it doesn't matter if you're 100-pound or 300-pound. The, all the organs that actually deal with that stuff are the same, right? The liver's the same size, the heart's the same size, the stomach's the same size. So it doesn't really matter if the person's got a bit of extra padding. It doesn't matter if the guy's got, you know, extra muscle and fat. Bottom line is it's basically the same. Now, if that's your initial thought, if you're that kind of, um, you know, devil's advocate kind of, kind of person, that's a very reasonable reply to what I just said. But it just happens to be completely wrong. Um, so if you do the research on this, there is a very wide and significant difference in the size, not just of humans, but of all their internal organs and glands. So I didn't, I remember I researched this years ago, I don't have it in front of me now. This is the beauty of it being a podcast, not a course, I don't have to be fully prepared. Uh, but you know, you can Google this yourself or ask AI, although AI is never reliable. Um, you know, what is the largest liver recorded versus what is the in an adult versus what is the smallest liver recorded? What is the largest stomach recorded? What is the smallest stomach recorded? As I remember, the variation, for instance, and you know, liver and stomach are two key ones, so let's talk about it. That uh, the the biggest livers, and these are not like aberrations, this is just on a you know an average scale, are about two and a half times the size of the smallest livers. And I've, as I remember, the variation in the stomach is quite a lot more. So the biggest stomachs are like five times the size of the smallest stomachs. So now when I say size, I mean literally autopsy, cut it out, throw it on the scale. So that's how much variation there is just in the size of those organs. So do you think a, uh, I can't remember again, like, but let's say like, do you think a five pound stomach is going to produce the same amount of stomach acid as a one pound stomach? No, right? And if there can be as much variation as five times in just the literal weight of an organ, how much variation could there be in terms of the function of the organ? So to go back to that stomach acid question, the size of the stomach could vary by up to five times, but I would say, and I realize this is conjecture, I don't think this has ever been, it's very difficult to test a live human organism for claims like this, but I would say the amount of stomach acid produced could vary by at least 10 times between you know, the person with the least versus the person with the most. Now with the liver, as I said, based on the research I did before, it was a bit less. I think it was two and a half times variance, but again, the person with the biggest liver, and again, when I say big, I don't mean 
uh, you know, as a result of like enlarging due to f uh, fatty liver disease or anything like that. I'm talking about purely in terms of like a reasonably healthy liver, but just natural in terms of a very big person versus a very small person. Um, like how much, how much would bile production vary between the person with a very smallest or, uh, liver and the very biggest? Again, I'm only guessing, but I would say something like five to 10 times. Like it could easily be that. Now, bear in mind with all of this, I'm not talking about dysfunction. So it's like a common thing if you're an alternative health world, you may have heard like a healthy liver will produce up to a quarter bile a day, where an unhealthy liver that's all blocked and congested and cholestasis, they may only produce a tablespoon. You may have heard something like that before. I think Andreas Moritz, for instance, says it in his um, Liver and Gall Better Cleanse book that I know a lot of people are into in the alternative health world. I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about when they're healthy, what is the variation between them, let alone when they become dysfunctional. And if we talk about the difference between a liver that is genetically right at the highest end of the scale in terms of how big it is, right at the top of the end of the scale as to how much bile it produces, and then we compare that to someone with a small liver with low bile production who then also has cholestasis or liver congestion and all the rest of it. The difference between bile production would be massive. Now, why am I going on and on about this? Because this is actually the basis to me of this system. And I say to me, I'm gonna to say to me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, qualifying this, I'm not an expert on this, so I'm gonna speak from my own perspective. Um, but you know, I, I think I'm fairly well informed. Let's see if anyone who speaks English comments on this video who knows better than me. <laughs> um, they may do, they may find me because I'm the only English one. Uh, as far as I know. So that's a huge difference. So now, um, I mentioned two organs there. There's two other of note to the system. So there's also the lungs and there's also the kidneys. And again, similarly, there is significant difference in level of strength and function between those organs as well. Okay. So but let's pick up the stomach and the uh, liver because these are the easiest ones to understand. So a person right at that top end of the scale of bile production and a person right at the bottom of that end of the bile production, what would happen if they both ate a large quantity of fatty meat? Somebody's going to do okay and somebody's not going to do okay. Yeah, that is the simple answer, right? Absolutely. The person with the small liver producing low amounts of bile, who's eating large amounts of fatty meat, they are gonna struggle to digest that meat. They're gonna struggle to be able to deal with the fat because of the lack of bile, and they may well struggle with the pathogenic bacteria that are coming in because of uh, the bile, which also, excuse me, which also helps with that. Um, okay, so that's obvious. And what about the stomach, right? How is a person going to handle the difference between having like a big meal, like an, you know, an American Midwest size plate or Indiana, right, Chrissy? Like full of food. Um, how is a person with a large stomach producing lots of stomach acid going to handle that versus a person with a very small stomach producing a very small amount of stomach acid, right? Yeah, absolutely. Again, same sort of thing. One person's going to finish the meal easily, go, mm, that was great. The other one's going to be, oh, God, you know, like... Need to go uh, lay feelings. down. Ooh, where's the acid? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something. Yeah, if not outright, you need to vomit, right? So, yeah, there's a huge difference. Okay. Now, why would there be this difference? So this is where we go a little bit into speculation. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about some common carnivore and vegan ideas. I'm familiar with both. So a carnivore... I've seen graphics of both of these. Maybe we can find it and give links to the episode, Chrissy, if it's easy to find. Um, a carnivore will go, here are all these qualities of the human digestive system. This proves that the human being is primarily a carnivore. And then a vegan will look at the human digestive system and go, look at all these things about the human digestive system. This proves that human beings are innately a herbivore. <laughs> So they both look and they both come to completely opposite conclusions. Now, is one of them crazy? Actually, I think not. Like my understanding of evolutionary theory, and you don't have to, you know, if you believe in the Bible, you know, God made the world 6,000 years ago, that's okay. Bear with me with this bit. Um, but it does seem, based on our evolutionary history, that 
at one point we were living in a kind of garden of eden like existence where there was kind of an abundance of food especially plant matter and we kind of probably had a diet similar to the primates chimps uh, bonobos as well, you know, like the ones that are the closest re relation to us. And what does that mean? A lot of plant matter and a bit of animal matter here and then when it was easy. And so what is the evidence for that? One of the pieces of evidence is the very long digestive tract, um, especially, you know, the large, large intestine. So a pure herbivore has that, plus they also have other stuff, like a pure herbivore that only has... Um, like eats grass all day, like a cow or whatever, they have several stomachs. So it turns out a lot of plant matter, especially a lot of fibrous plant matter, is very difficult to break down into calories, which is why most herbivores are eating most of the day and they have a very elaborate digestive process, several stomachs, as I said, often, and a very long, large intestine. And inside that large intestine, they often have something, well, they, they always have something called a cecum, which is like an area where that, fibrous plant material is fermented even more and then that creates um, these short chain fatty acids. Now once you go from fiber which is a non-calorie source to a fatty acid that's a calorie source so that transformation has then occurred and then that can be turned into actual fuel. Uh, but as I say it's a laborious process it requires a lot of digestive power specifically a long big large intestine. Okay um, now for a carnivore they have a different problem they have the problem of um, the meat potentially being full of pathogenic bacteria, parasites, other stuff that wants to kill them, and also being tough in its own different way. So there's kind of the fibrous toughness, but then there's the kind of meat toughness. And so that requires a different digestive strength, and the digestive strength that's specifically required for that more than any, um, I would say, would be a strong uh, stomach with large amounts of stomach acid, and that's uh, and very acidic stomach acid. That's the other thing, and that's one of the things that carnivores point to to prove that human beings are primarily carnivores is that we have a stomach acid or are easily capable of producing a stomach acid that is a very similar acidity to the most carnivorous carnivores, like not the omnivores, the animals that only ever eat meat. They will have a, a you know, stomach acid pH of one, two, something like that. And human beings have the same. So that's part of their evidence for that. So, but the vegans go, well, we got this really long intestine. That's not common for a carnivore, is it? Well, no, that's, that's true. So we kind of have a combination. So my understanding of the history of that is for a while we had an abundance of plant foods and we ate food maybe similar to a chimp. Then something happened, some cataclysm maybe, some ice age maybe, some Noah's Ark maybe, who knows. And we had a period of time where it was much, plant food was much more scarce. And so we adapted to eating more animal food because that was maybe all that was available. And, you know, there could be all kinds of reasons for that, right? And maybe it was different for different people, uh, dif you know, different for different ancestors. For some of them, if they were on an island, they would have adapted to eating much more fish. For others, if they were in the middle of the mainland, we would have adapted to eating much more like uh, herbivorous grass-eating animals, you know, on the plains and the savannas and, and all the rest of it, right? So, uh, and then maybe some of our ancestors didn't go through that cataclysm and they kind of stayed being more adapted to eating plants potentially as well. And then eventually some of us worked out that, um, you know, we could also milk animals and then maybe some of us adapted more to dairy. Um, and so, you know, we're now in a position where we have a, a long, large intestine and small intestine, like a herbivore, but many of us at least have a very acidic stomach and a strong liver and gallbladder that produce a lot of bile, like a carnivore. So like the top half, the first half of our digestive system is kind of like a carnivore. The second half of our digestive system is more like a herbivore. That would be kind of the, the summation of it. And so it's like we adapted over the course of a long time, tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of years. Actually, it's listened to science thing recently about how scientists have changed their mind in the last few decades about how adaptation to those kind of environmental circumstances doesn't take as long as they used to think. Like it can happen in, you know, like tens of thousands of years. It doesn't take millions like they thought before for those kind of adaptations to take place. But anyway, however long it was, we seem to have made that adaptation. And so we still have a remnant of when we were 
pure herbivores or larger herbivores maybe, which is called the appendix, which used to be called the cecum. So this is something that is now considered like a useless appendage, but that was originally a cecum, a very important part of our digestive system that's now shriveled down to almost nothing and they consider it non-essential enough that they, they cut it out. And well, they consider it non-essential, but, you know, there are potentially things that, uh, you know, it, it is doing that they just don't know about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think non-essential is correct because people don't die if you remove it. Um, but non-important, I agree, is a much more uh, dubious um, uh, description. But even that would maybe vary by body type, which we're going to talk about next, right, to fi finally answer your question. So, all right, if everything I just said is true, and as I said, as far as I'm aware, this is mainstream science that's pretty undisputed, then is it possible that some of us um, went through more of that adaptation towards carnivorousness than others? That's the first simple question. So uh, some of us have more stomach acid and more bile and even shorter intestines. Some of us have less stomach acid, less bile, and still longer intestines. And the answer to that, as I said, based on all the mainstream science is yes. I talked about stomach and liver before, but it's actually the same with intestines. Some people have very long, large intestines. Some people actually have very short, large intestines as well. So that's another difference. And again, the difference would be uh, at least double in terms of weight, again, in autopsy, from what I remember. I think it might actually be more than that, but I can't remember exactly. But it's significant, again, significant difference. So... Again, if we take the extremes, so we've got one person, really strong stomach, loads of stomach acid, really strong liver, loads of bile, really short, large intestine. Um, would that person benefit from the same diet as the person with the opposite? Really long, large intestine, really weak stomach, really weak liver. No, right? You see you're shaking your head. Like it's obvious that one person is more adapted to one type of diet and one person is more adapted to the other. Now, there are all kinds of further refinements in the Korean system than only that. But that is the primary one, actually, that the whole thing is based on. So that's a my, so, before you go, so just my understanding of really looking at this is depending on the strengths or the weaknesses of these particular organs, that is what will determine the type of food that your body can process and process well. Yes, and not just food, there's other stuff they tack onto it as well, but yeah, it is primarily diet, exactly. So now, they use a lot of kind of Eastern terminology to describe this, which I will now get into, but I know a lot of people will switch off with that, either because they think it's nonsense, bullshit, or just because you know they have no idea, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So just bear the scientific facts in mind <laughs> that I shared with you up until now, when I start getting into more the Eastern terminology for things. And let's just start with those two types. Now they actually divide it kind of into four basic types with then subtypes, so therefore that's why it's eight body types in total. But it's basically four types and then the other four are like in between, if that makes sense. Um, so there's like the four main types and then there's like if you're, but like there's North, East, South, West and then there's North, East, South, East. Mm -hmm. Does that no, make that sense? makes so absolute sense, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's the way that they basically do it. Uh, but they do, you know, base it just on those two types to start with. So um, the type with strong stomach acid and strong bile is one type, and then the type with... Now, here's where it gets from into pure science into a little bit more speculation. So first thing to understand is that in the Eastern system, um, the organs are described, and I say the Eastern system, this is the Chinese system, I think, originally, uh, but the Korean system inherited it. I think the Japanese is very similar. Um, Indian is somewhat different, but has some similarities as well. So it's a lot of the, uh, a lot of the Asian systems have this in common. This idea that organs have um, kind of pairs or partners. So, in, and, and they relate this to elements, but it's really just a classification system. Don't get lost in the elements as, as being more meaningful than that necessarily. So um, they'd say, so the first organ pair is uh, liver, that goes to the gallbladder. That's pretty simple to understand. They're kind of next to each other. They perform very similar function. All right, that one's easy. Uh, now stomach, 
they would often partner with spleen. But again, because the system was created recently, they realized probably the pancreas is much more important than the spleen. So in this system, they talk about stomach and pancreas. So stomach and pancreas, that's another partner. And again, they're very close to each other, they're right next to each other, they perform a similar function. One of them creates acid, one of them creates alkali, they're kind of partners in that way. That's a pretty easy one to understand. Um, the next one is uh, not a digestive function, but I'll explain how this fits in a second. The kidneys, uh, that would be the third type, the kidney type, and then the partner to that is the bladder. And then the last one is the lungs, and this is the one that's the least easy to understand from a Western point of view, but the lungs are partnered with the large intestine. So that's the other one. Now, anyone who's actually familiar with TCM is gonna go, well, well, when you missed one, what about the heart and the small intestine? Um, so the Koreans do acknowledge that, but there is no type that is primarily that. That's kind of like the, the one that they say is the one in the middle. So they're focusing on the other four types. So we're gonna leave the heart and small intestine aside. So those are the four types, uh, liver, uh, liver, stomach, although actually it's pancreas, liver, pancreas, kidneys, lungs. Those are the four basic types, and they relate that to the four elements, which is uh, wood, um, the, uh, wait, I wanna make sure I say it in the right order, wood, earth, water, and metal. That's how, they, uh, that's how they do it. So that's the first thing to understand. What on earth has lungs got to do with large intestine? I've seen this explained before by experts in this field. I mean, there is certainly a connection. For instance, the way we breathe or like influence the peristalsis of the large intestine, that's why it's so important to belly breathe. Like that's one example of it. There are kind of ties that are a bit harder to understand that I won't go into. You don't really have to be, believe that they are tied together in some special way to, un, to get benefit from this system, but just understand that's something that's a given from this Eastern perspective. All right, and as, as I said, I think the rest of the partnerships make sense from a logical Western point of view, right? Yeah, they do, they do. And it's one of those things that even, you know, you don't even have to argue, just say, it. just take it as what it is for now as we move forward in, in the explanation and the understanding. Excellent, yeah. So the other thing to understand is, whereas in our society we focus more on like dysfunction, maybe on systems like mine, more like deficiencies, excesses of toxicity, stuff like that, the Eastern perspective is really all about balance. So from their perspective, if things are in balance, everything is good, the health will occur, and if things are out of balance, then illness will occur, and it's really as simple as that. Now. All kinds of things like excess of this and deficiency of that and blockage of this and all that might cause imbalance, but fundamentally balance is what is sought. Okay, so once we understand that, then we understand. Then we need to understand that I mentioned there's four basic types. So the way that they view it, there are each of these types have like a pair that are antagonistic to each other, and so there is liver is antagonistic to lungs, and then uh, stomach, pancreas, is antagonistic to kidneys. Now, what does that actually mean from a practical sense? So let me try and go back to science for a second. In the real world, there is not an abundance of resources for everything. Have you ever met someone, Chrissy, who's like really good looking and beautiful and really present, and like really high in intelligence, and really likable, and really physically strong, and you're like, that's not fair, you've got it all, right? <laughs> and you don't meet many people like that, right? right? Most people, like, it seems like their gifts are like allocated, maybe they have one or two, right? Maybe you're the beautiful one, maybe you're the smart one, maybe you're the funny one, maybe, maybe you're the, the whatever, do you, do you see what I mean? Like. That's usually how it works. People don't usually have everything. Some very gifted people have several things. That's usually, you very, very meet someone who has like genuinely everything. Okay, and that's because there's a finite amount of resources available and it takes energy, you know? Um, you, you, have, you know, there's the, um, there's the stereotype, which is broadly true of the jock and the, the nerd or whatever, because 
you know, if you're putting a lot of energy into your brain and intelligence, you're probably not putting a huge amount of effort into physical strength and prowess and vice versa. Now, of course, you sometimes get very smart athletic people and sometimes you get people who are neither, but the, the stereotype exists for a reason. Often people specialize, right? Human beings don't specialize as much as ants, but we do specialize to some degree, right? We're like, I'm really gonna be good at this thing rather than being okay at everything. We specialize and there's a genetic basis to that. Okay, so if that's true for like qualities that are easily recognizable, then I would say it's also true for investment in different organ systems. So let's just say that the, the genetically the person is coded to create a big strong liver that produces loads of bile because it's a more of a carnivorous um, uh, body, for instance, right? D d is that body then going to have a all other factors being equal, is it going to have exactly the same amount of energy left over as a body that's not specializing in that way? All other factors being equal, the answer would be no, right? There's going to be a little bit less to go around. There's going to be a little bit less for the brain, a little bit less for the kidneys, a little bit less for the muscles, whatever, right? So that's the idea. There's only so much energy. Very few people are gifted in every sense, right? And there's only so much energy available to the organism. Even if it has a lot of energy available, if it chooses to specialize by really strengthening one area, whether it's the brain or the liver or this or that, then there's going to be, by the law of nature, less for something else. And so the way that this system sees it, and really going back, as I said, to ancient Chinese medicine for thousands of years sees it, it will tend to be, if there's a lot of investment by the body in the liver and the gallbladder, then there's less investment in the lungs and the large intestine. For whatever reason, and they would call it like an elemental thing, uh, they are antagonistic to each other. Now, interestingly, based on what I just said about how some of us are more carnivore and some of us are more herbivore, I just said that more herbivore types will have a much more developed large intestine. And also, if you think about uh, aerobic capacity, have you ever watched like a chase between, you know, a, a deer or, or something and a lion or a tiger or something like that? Have you noticed if the predator doesn't get it pretty quickly, like it's not going to get it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, uh, it tires very fast. Yeah, and that's because the deer can run for like hours if need be. Usually the, the, the tiger or the lion has got like a couple of minutes in them at the most, right? So from this perspective, uh, the lion has got much more of the of its total energy dedicated to um you know the the liver and the gallbladder whereas it's got less energy dedicated to the lungs and the large intestine it's got less energy dedicated to the large intestine because it doesn't need to break down and ferment lots of fibrous material because it's not eating that and it's got less capacity for the lungs which you know shows in its lack of athletic endurance it can it can sprint it can't marathon right so that, does that make so, yeah, sense so it far? Makes sense, yeah. So, so even though it seems like just another theory, I want to show you there is a biological basis to this, you know, relationship between things that they that they talk about. Okay. Um, so, so that's one example: lungs versus liver. Now, the other one that is a bit less uh, easy to understand. I'll give you this. <laughs> um, would be the stomach versus the kidneys. So, so that's the other one. But it is the same idea that um, if you have more focus on one, uh, you tend to have less on the other. I, if, if there is an equally plausible biochemical scientific basis to it, I think there probably is, I just don't know it. So I can't explain it as well as I just, I think I explained it pretty well with the, uh, the lungs and the liver. Um, I don't think I, well, I didn't even try and explain it as well with the stomach and the kidneys. Um, but I am guessing that there is some kind of basis uh, to it as well. So, um, I, I, I mean, at a guess, um, I would say, you know, with the stomach, the focus is more on, uh, you know, uh, breaking down proteins. And that's for um, something that is more omnivorous, that has a lot of food available to it. The kidneys are more like, um, in Chinese medicine, they're more like a, a source of reserve energy. So if I were to guess, I would say that the stronger stomach animal or type of person is more geared to be able to handle any food that comes their way and they're expecting a lot of food, whereas the opposite person is 
they tend to have a weak stomach, they're not expecting a lot of food to come along, and so they're expecting to have to have a lot of reserve power available to them, which is which is what the kidneys give to them. Again, that's a bit hard to explain from a Western scientific point of view, but I, I'm pretty sure that's like the the, the, the uh, underlying basis of it. Okay, so those are the four types. And so um, out of those, and before I go to the, the subtypes that make them eight types, let's focus on those types a little bit more. Because honestly, the further division into two subtypes is... Significant once you get into it, but fairly minor from you know most points of view. So, what they say is the the liver type that we've talked about, the strong liver type. They are the ones that are the most predisposed to pure carnivore. They're also the ones that are the least predisposed to plant food, especially fibrous matter. With some of them, so with one of the two subtypes, you know their big thing is that they have like a um, strong liver that produces lots of bile. That's like the main quality about them. With the other subtype, their main thing is that they have really small, large intestine. And so um, this kind of slight variation as to how each of them approaches it. But honestly, 90% of the advice is the same. So what is the advice? The advice is carnivore, not totally pure carnivore. Some plant foods are fine, especially actually root vegetables. So the healing diet for that liver type in a nutshell, and obviously there's lots of nuance to it, but in a nutshell is meat, especially red meat, not fish. With one of the subtypes, they don't do as well with chicken. With one of the other subtypes, they do better with pork. But beef is like supposed to be the medicine of medicines for that specific type. Um, and then the absolute worst thing for them, the poison of poisons, is green leafy vegetables and uh, fish, especially shellfish. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. And we're looking at that from the strength of the liver and what it does in its breaking down of everything and how it processes. Yeah, the red meat and the green vegetables are pretty easy to understand scientifically from my point of view. So the red meat is, if you're producing a lot of bile, you're eating a lot of fatty meat. Again, if you listen to the carnivore, like lean meat is probably not what most of us, because there's not that, we talked about this in a previous episode, there's not that many calories you can and in fact even should be getting from protein. You really need most of your calories to either come from fat or carbs. Well, if you're eating pure carnivore, pretty much almost none of your calories are coming from carbs. So a lot of your cal calories must be coming from fats that's a ketogenic diet, right? And so you need a lot of strong liver function for a majority of your calories to come from fats. So that's the basic underlying idea behind it. Same for dairy, by the way. Obviously, East Asians famously not lovers of dairy, so there's not a strong dairy emphasis. But yeah, the, I was going to ask because that is the one thing that is uh, left out of the chart. That, and we will put the chart and the links to these things in the description so that people can access them. But that dairy, I'm glad you brought that up because that is um, very absent <laughs> in looking it at definitely, this. It is in the chart. We've got beef, pork, chicken, lamb, milk, butter, cheese. It's, oh, it's just right looking at there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, you can see it's like, it's, uh, what's the word? Recommended, not super recommended. Like, um, th there is no type that dairy is super recommended for, although, like, beef is super recommended for the liver type, for instance. Um, but, yeah, uh, the, the type that will really do well with that is uh, both the liver type and the stomach type do well with dairy uh, and, and red meat in general. And that's because, again, 
macronutrient wise, it's very similar. What is it? It's about 25% protein, about 50% fat, a fatty cut of meat or a lump of cheese, right? That's, you know, very, very similar. Now, obviously, you know, milk itself has some carbs and stuff. I, I realize it's an exception and butter is only fat. But again, generally, <laughs> we're talking about uh, quite a bit of protein and quite a lot of fat. Uh, so, so it makes sense why having a very strong liver, that's that's like perfect kind of diet for you. Uh, that's actually not the justification given in that system. What they say is that beef is very healing and strengthening for the large intestine. What justification they have for that, I'm not 100% sure. But what I think is interesting is show me a carnivore diet person who doesn't think beef is amazing. Like they all do. They all, you know, and again, they also, uh, I've seen medical doctors say beef is the best. I don't think they're really giving a scientific explanation. Some of them are maybe saying, you know, it's lower in omega-6s and stuff, which is true. But no one's really explained to me why beef and bison is better than, you know, lamb, for instance, or venison. And yet they all seem to think beef is amazing. Some people are even famously doing like the lion diet where they're literally only eating beef and nothing else and claiming they're healing themselves. So again, it's interesting. Anecdotally, a bunch of people, none of whom have probably ever heard of this system, have come to exactly the same conclusion that the beef is like the medicine if you are this type. Um, so anyway, the plant fiber stuff, again, especially green leafy vegetables, makes a lot of sense from two angles. First of all, a green leafy vegetable is going to be bitter. Bitter things absolutely increase bile production. This is famously, you know, known in uh, naturopathic medicine and all the rest of it. They, they often recommend bitters to increase bile production. So this is super simple. So if your liver is already producing a possibly excessive amount of bile, do you want to eat foods that produce even more bile? No, that's going to imbalance you further, especially when there is a limited amount of energy available to the organism. Again, this is more from an Eastern point of view. Even more energy going to the liver means even less going to the lungs and large intestine. That's from their point of view, right? The other reason why leafy greens are not going to work for you if you're that type is because you've got a short large intestine that, first of all, could easily get overfilled with if it's got a lot of soluble fiber, which then um, increases. And then second of all, it's got the least capacity to adequately you know, ferment that from um, that point of view. So... Um, like it just wants to get it out quickly. Again, try feeding a lot of grass to your cat, you know? Like, in fact, why do cats eat grass? It's only ever because they want to be sick, you know? Like, that's what they're trying to do. That's not something that, uh, and, you know, same for spinach or anything else. It's not something that they can break down. So that's like, um, and so we've talked about the liver type. So the opposite type, the lung type. So again, they have Strong, big lungs, generally very good aerobic capacity, very good, especially with endurance. Um, one of the other ways you can tell that you're the carnivore type, by the way, is um, you find it hard to talk for too long. Like you just don't have that same aerobic capacity. The opposite type, uh, they might be like your Olympic distance swimmer or something like that. You know, they can hold the breath raises underwater. They have you know excellent endurance, aerobic capacity and stuff like that. Certainly the lung type are not wimps just because they're not the lion types. In fact, they're often big, tall, strong, big chested, uh, like impressive people. Um, so no one's talking about anyone being a wimp here. But yeah, they're just, a, the, you know, the, the different, um, different strength. And so they do really well with the exact opposite of what I just said. Like beef, meat in general and dairy and beef especially is literally a poison to that type and um, green leafy vegetables are like uh, a medicine to that type. Now, again, the Korean type, just as there is no meat eating type in the free Ayurvedic doshas, there's no truly vegetarian type in the Korean system. I don't know if you've ever been to Korea, but um, they, I haven't either, uh, but I have been to uh, Korean neighborhoods, as I'm sure you have. And if you go to any kind of traditional Korean, and, and I've also lived in a house with Koreans um, back when I was 30, 31 years old. And I can tell you, I've never seen any of them eat a vegetarian meal in my life. Um, they love, they like meat. Oh, yeah, I just want to bring this up as well. It's like, why should we be listening to what the Koreans have to say? Well, this is what's interesting. 
what's the average age of lifespan for someone in the US or the UK with us spending a fortune on uh, healthcare? I was going to say, yeah, probably, you know, 60, 70 years old, somewhere in there. Yeah, it's 75, 76. So it's not bad. You know, we have a lot of, bear in mind, we have a lot of medicine to keep us alive, but then again, so do they. Uh, for the Koreans and the Japanese, it's about 85 to 86. So they get a good 10 years in this. Now, why am I also mentioning the Japanese? Because the Japanese actually also often follow this system, as I'm about to explain. So two countries that where a lot of people do actually follow this system, they live about 10 years longer than us. So that's another thing that is interesting. And in fact, uh, Japan has the lowest incidence of um, cardiovascular uh, di ill health disease in the world. And Korea is you know, close to that as well. And Koreans certainly don't eat everything clean and no processed as well. From my personal experience, they eat a hell of a lot of packet food and processed food and all the rest of it. So it's not because they're such clean living. It's not because their air quality is so great. It's not because their water quality is so great. There is something else going on in Korea and Japan. Uh, but let's say especially Korea that's accounting for them living so long. Now you could say it's all down to the genes. Genes obviously are a factor. I'm going to believe that given what I do. But I think this may be another one, which is why I'm talking about it. So anyway, back to it. Um, there's no such thing as a truly vegetarian type in Korea because there's no such thing as a true vegetarian in Korea, in my experience. But the, the closest they have to it is this opposite type. And they say, this type does really well with vegetables. They often use the word vegetarian. But when they say vegetarian, what they mean is plants and fish. <laughs> so they say, you know, if you're this opposite lung type with weak, weak bile production, you know, low stomach acid probably, uh, you should not be eating meat, you should not be having dairy, um, you should not be having egg yolk at least because of the fat, but you should be having fish. And so they actually strongly recommend fish. Now, again, they have a theory for this. They say that, uh, again, that uh, fish kind of reduces the power of the liver and increases the power of the, the lungs and the large intestine. I can't really find justification for that personally. I'm not sure if it's true or if it's just their way of saying, look, here's still a way to get some protein despite not eating uh, red meat uh, or, or, or poultry. Um, so that's possible. I mean, fish are naturally more easily lean. I would say that it's quite hard to get a, you know, a cut of meat that is less than 5% fat. It's very easy to get a cut of fish that's less than 5% fat. So it's certainly easier to get lean protein from fish uh, and shellfish than it is from meat. So maybe that may be the source of it. But let's assume that these guys may know what they're talking about and they understand some stuff that maybe I or even Western science in general doesn't fully understand. What they would say is, look, if you are this lung type and you want to be pure vegetarian, that's totally fine. Um, ideally, you'd be having some fish as well, especially shellfish, because they believe it's very healing. But you know what? Green leaves are also very healing. Vegetables in general are very healing. You know, rice and pulses and buckwheat, and you know, there's a whole list. And by all means, you could be perfectly healthy being this lung type, very healthy even, you know, on a pure vegetarian diet. Whereas if you are this opposite liver type, it's kind of suicidal to be like a pure vegetarian. It's going to really debilitate your health long term. Now, obviously, just let's just qualify this. People can get away with really stupid things for a long time, right? People can get away with drinking 20 units of alcohol a day for decades. People can get used to drink, smoking 40 cigarettes a day for decades. I'm not saying that as soon as you have the wrong diet, it's going to kill you. But I'm just saying if you have entirely the wrong diet for you from this perspective, then from this perspective, it's as bad for you as doing the things I just mentioned. It's as bad as being an alcoholic. It's as bad as being a chain smoker. If, you, if you're taking in exactly the opposite fuel of what you should be every time. And explain why that is. Down to inflammation, other things that are going on with the system, taking energy away, imbalancing. Yeah, it's good that you mentioned inflammation because that is actually, the immune system is one of the primary focuses. It's certainly not the only thing. Um, I mean, this gets down to something that we've talked about before, Chrissy, that if the digestive system is not healthy, it is the often considered accurately so the root of all other diseases. Um, when the digestive system does not have the right food, it doesn't have the right fuel in there, then it will lead to, uh, as you say, immune system reaction, which is then leads to systemic inflammation, weakened immunity, allergies and intolerances, lower energy, 
Uh, it leads to overgrowth of pathogenic organisms, which then create toxins. Those pathogenic organisms can spread, can spread. The toxins that they produce certainly will spread. Um, you know, via the villi and the small intestine, from there to the liver, then the bloodstream is going to poison the whole body, undermine it. So, yeah, in all the ways I've talked about in previous episodes, um, when you have totally the wrong fuel, it is, you know, as bad for you as anything. As much as I've always said in this podcast, and I stand by it, that there are more important things than only what you eat, and it is true. But what I am saying is, if you diametrically eat exactly the opposite of what actually suits you, that is still pretty bad. I have to, I have to acknowledge that. Um, <laughs> and, and as I said, th there is no overlap between those types, pretty much. I think there's like a couple of things, maybe white rice, again, in Asian culture, that's kind of assumed to be good for everyone. Uh, and that may be true because in Western science, we understand it to be hypoallergenic, right? It's like pretty much no one has an issue with it. But um, yeah, pretty much anything, if it is good for... One type it is bad for the other type. That's certainly true. There may be a few things that are neutral for everyone, but anything that's healing for one type will definitely be poisonous to the other and vice versa with these two types. Okay, and so what they'd say is the that first type is like a like a lion. So I think it's very funny that I think it's Michaela Petenson created the, the lion diet that eats purely beef because it is literally exactly... And maybe she does know the system. Maybe she just doesn't talk about it. I don't know. Um, but it's exactly what they say. And then the opposite type, they consider that to be like, you're like a fish. So what is a fish? Fish has a very good aerobic capacity, right? It's, uh, you know, it's obviously underwater, but, you know, fish still need oxygen. Um, and they can swim a long way and all that kind of stuff. And what does fish eat? Fish eats green leaves and other fish. <laughs> and so <laughs> that's the same basic principle, right? Um, now... The third type, and this, I would say the kidney type, although I know some who, like, one of my business partner, I ultimately worked out with him, he probably is this type. And again, I was still pretty skeptical of the system at the time, but I hadn't talked to him about it for years, and I asked him the other day, are you still eating exactly this kidney type diet? And he goes, if I eat any of the foods that are not supposed to be eaten by the kidney type diet, I immediately feel worse. And so long as I eat only the foods that are good or okay for that diet, I feel great. Interesting. Yeah, because that brings me to a point, because obviously, you know, oh, we're going to, I might be jumping ahead, but, oh, you know, it's so specific for that individual, but for others, when they discover, you know, as we're going to get into of how to figure out this stuff of, you know, whether they're eating it, not eating it, but they're like, yeah, but I don't feel so bad. And, I, and apparently it says I shouldn't be having that. So maybe we'll address that further on down the line, but it's an interesting point that you're bringing up. Yeah, it's more the extremes where it might be noticeable more easily. So, you know, there's a big list of stuff here. Um, and there can be all kinds of mitigating reasons why you get a false result. And we can talk about at least a couple of them, maybe from my experience and your experience. Um, just before we actually go into those other two types out of four, um, let me just say one more thing about the liver type and the lung type, which is very interesting. It's also actually true for the other two types, but I want to mention it now. The liver type does very well when it is when they feel warm and when they're sweating. And they actually also have a tendency to feel cold. So um, when they don't eat correctly, sorry, when they are not healthy, if they're eating plenty of meat and beef and, and you know, uh, dairy and uh, whatever else, all the rest of it, then they feel good. But if they are on the if they're generally unhealthy for whatever reason or if they're eating the wrong diet, they'll feel cold quite easily. Um, and so they like to be heated up. There's also this idea, again, from Chinese medicine that when the liver energy is excessive, it needs to vent, and the best way to vent it is through sweating. So heat and sweating are considered to be very desirable for someone with that excess um, now, if we think back to toxic bile theory and, you know, our interviews with Dr. Smith recently, who also, by the way, is a big fan of beef and considers it to be healing, um, and, and also Grant Jenner, who we've had on here, who, again, is a big fan of beef and it's one of the only things he eats and he's kind of healed himself of all the diseases he had by just basically eating beef and beans, which would indicate if there's any credence to this diet that he's a very specific diet and not another type, um, then... If we go back to that toxic bile theory idea, then um, one of the things that Dr. Smith talked about on the first interview of him is how beneficial it can be to 
um, do things that stimulate the conversion. Um, I won't go into detail on this because I don't want to go too far, but do things and one of those things being uh, exposure to red light and sunlight, which then cause this toxin to be converted into a water-soluble toxin, which then allow it to be easily sweated out. And so he was a big fan of that system. Well, funnily enough, another thing that's recommended for this liver type is heat, sunlight, red light, um, and sweating. So again, you know, interesting. A lot of these people who recommend this, this kind of diet. And if you think like, again, um, traditionally, what would be the cultures that would be most likely to be this diet, just logically, it would probably be the ones that are extremely north, right? Like uh, Inuit, Scandinavian, Siberian, those kind of people, right? And, uh, uh, you know, be because when you're that far north, carbohydrates are pretty scarce, right? So you're more likely to be eating animal food because that's literally all there is in, in you know, anything other than, you know, refrigerators and all that have only existed for 100 years. And, and uh, but, you know, until recently, right, it was basically what you could catch, what you could hunt, what you could kill, what you could grow. And you can't grow very much in those climates. So it's going to be largely what you can catch and what you can kill. And so those cultures tend to love sweating, right? They often a big fan of saunas. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I thought that was interesting. So, the opposite type, though, the lung type, the opposite is good for them. They really thrive with cold. Um, they also thrive with uh, like deep breathing exercises that emphasize the out breath. And I was trying to think, like, vegetarian diet loves cold, um, doesn't have a huge digestive capacity, loves carbohydrates, um, loves doing breathing exercises who it's like Wim Hof right like that's like a classic archetype of that type and it's again it's interesting that those things go together in the extremes right um that you know that system has really helped a lot of people but again if you are this liver type all of every single bit of that advice would be bad for you. The vegetarian diet would be bad for you. The hard, high carb diet that Wim Hof doesn't necessarily recommend, but which he personally does, would be bad for you. Um, the cold exposure would be bad for you. The intense deep breathing exercises would be bad for you. So like every single thing um, is not necessarily a good idea. And I know it was very popular for a while, but I see a lot of people in the kind of communities that I'm in, which honestly I think often are these liver types, like rebelling against that now. I, I don't know um, when this will come out, but we just released an episode, second episode with Jay Feldman, where he basically talks about hormesis and how it's nonsense and there's no such thing as good stress and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't disagree with him, but I think it's a philosophy that kind of makes more sense, again, for this liver type. Like that it, it doesn't help them to be going through those stresses. It's not an all across the board, yes. It's, there's, there's, specifics that need to be potentially looked at yeah potentially and i realize this is getting more in the realm of speculation now um but you know it's very much a core part of their system so i wanted to talk about it, it is not only diet um this uh, it, you know exposure to heat or cold is very important as well from their point of view and in fact one of the best best medicines for one of the two subtypes of liver type one of the two subtypes of liver type who's the gallbladder type you know, one of the main things recommended for them is they have to keep warm, especially they have to keep their abdomen warm. And like cold for them will make them sick very quickly and very easily. And so that's why I wanted to mention it. If you're struggling, you may even be eating a carnivore diet, but you may still not be feeling great. And that may be because you're doing cold showers every morning. You know, it's worth considering. That's why I wanted to mention it. No, and you do bring up an extremely valid point here is like, you know, if, you know, some of our listeners are, you know, uh, listening to Grant, listening to Dr. Garrett, and they are even eating a heavy meat diet and they're like, what's going on? Maybe, uh, you know, they say this should be working. It's not, you know, then this could be something that they can look at and, and it may be able to help take them to that next step. Yeah, and I know some of them, they love the meat, but they say the fiber doesn't work for them. Well, that's more likely to be true of the, the liver subtype, especially that has a very short large intestine. 
from this Korean system. They say, you know, a lot of fiber just isn't good for them. Um, they feel f overly full very easily. They're very likely to have kind of symptoms of IBS and, and like discomfort when they have too much fiber. And so again, you know, Dr. Smith is very, um, you know, just do whatever works. I, you know, I agree. And, you know, he says that if, if uh, but he recommends to have some kind of fiber. And I think that does make sense because it is mopping up the, um, the excess bile and stopping it being reabsorbed. Uh, which that type is likely to produce. But like thinking that the more fiber, the better is an idea that is not true for all types. I guess that's that's the point. You've got to find, you know, what works for you, maybe. what What's the most absorbing of bile while creating least bulk, which is going to overwhelm your large intestine, and the least uh, gas, which is going to you know, overwhelm your large intestine. Anyway, let me get to the other two types because we still have so much to talk about. So the other types, the other dichotomy is between Strong stomach, producing lots of stomach acid, and uh, then strong kidneys. So, um, and often the kidneys honestly are less focused on it. It's really more about either strong stomach or weak stomach. <laughs> That's like the main differentiator between them. Um, and so people with a strong stomach, I think the animal totem that's often used for them, we talked about the lion, the fish, is like the dog. Like they are the omnivore. Out of the four different capacities, they produce the most stomach acid. Um, so what's the distinction? So this is kind of two different types of carnivore. Yes, the dog is an omnivore, but they, in my experience anyway, a dog will still always prefer animal food in nine times out of 10. Um, but you know, they, they can eat everything, that's the point. Now, what else, ca what else can dogs eat? Literal S-H-I-T, right? I don't know if that's gonna get me in trouble, but what what makes it? But it's pre-digested so protein. <laughs> well, yeah, Sometimes. but why can't you? But why can't you eat it or I no, eat very it? Very true, because I have the strongest stomach acid, so it just annihilates it. Right, that's the point. Whereas if you feed a dog a lot of fat, what happens? Oh no, not happy. They're not good, right? So literally, they can eat poop, which is like fifty percent dangerous, often bacteria, and feel fine but they can't eat like a cut of meat that is 50% fat. So what does that tell you? Their specialization is more on the scavenger end of the um, scale of carnivore rather than the predator end of carnivore. If you're on the predator end of carnivore, you're probably picking the nicest, juiciest, fattiest animals that you can manage to catch. And so what you need is a strong liver. That's your primary focus. Whereas if you're scavenging, you're just eating whatever you can, what you need to prioritize is the strongest stomach acid so that you don't, you know, make yourself sick when you're eating some half rotting, <laughs> you know, whatever corpse or, 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 or half digested food or whatever, it, whatever disgusting thing my dog routinely eats if, if I, uh, if I let, you know, if she gets away with it. So, so you can see that different in specialization again, even within the carnivore realm, right? Now, it's true, some are specialized to do both, and that's the in-between type that we were talking about. Like, that's why there's eight types, not four types. There are a few that are that subtype that is strong stomach and strong liver. Um, so that does exist as well. But let's just talk about the four types first. We're doing northeast, southwest, like we said, and then we'll do the subtypes. So strong um, stomach acid, that means they can eat almost anything, right? Well, People with strong stomach acid, one of the indicators is that you have the strongest appetite and that you can get away with eating the biggest meals. Um, that is like a, a classic indicator of that type. Um, another indicator is that because you actually produce a lot of stomach acid, there's this idea in alternative medicine, which I don't fully agree with, but that a lot of digestive problems are caused by a lack of stomach acid. And of course, for every type other than this stomach type, that could actually be true. But for this type, it's not true. So with this stomach type, I'd say dairy is probably the most beneficial for them than all the other types. Why? Because dairy has large amounts of calcium, and the calcium helps to neutralize that stomach acid to some degree and, and stop it from being excessive. Uh, probably the worst thing for that stomach type is foods that increase the level of acid further. So um, like um, the uh, spicy food, for instance, is famously 
not good for this type. Ginger, I'm just looking at this list here, you know, one of the worst. Generally, of course, ginger is considered to be a digestive panacea. Um, not just, you know, like primarily even in the East where, you know, this system comes from. Uh, they kind of love it often. But in fact, for this type, it's the worst because what does ginger do? Scientifically proven to increase stomach acid production. That's not beneficial. In the same way that bitters, including green leafy vegetables, is going to make a liver dominant type even worse than a, I can't think of the word for it, stomach acid secreted gog, there's a herbal term, but anyway, those compounds, uh, those foods that contain compounds that increase stomach acid production are going to be bad for this type. So spicy food is often the worst, dairy is one of the best. Now they have theories that I don't understand the uh what's the word the western justification for so obviously you know hot peppers onions ginger cinnamon mustard wasabi all of that kind of stuff is bad for this type that's all stuff that increases the production of stomach acid that's pretty obvious they also say not to have like some proteins like not to have chicken not to have lamb there's a bit more of an esoteric reason for that uh, especially lamb is considered to be um like very heating in eastern medicine I don't really know if there's a if there's a Western scientific basis for that, but just like with there's not really the Western scientific basis for why beef would be so much healing than lamb, but for some reason everyone seems to agree that it is. It's something to try if you are identifying what I'm saying about the stomach type so far. You could try not having those meats. You could try not having poultry and not having lamb, sticking to beef and pork. Pork is supposed to be very good for that type. Obviously, I recommend like wild boar or something like the best form of pork if you can have pork, but you know, and dairy. And they might well be better proteins for you. It's worth a try if you think that you are that type. Um, as I said, the, so the best thing would be that, the worst thing is spicy food. Again, this all makes sense from a logical point of view, I would say, other than the, the protein types, right? But, you know, it makes sense that you, you be, that, that things that reduce stomach acid, like um, dairy, would be healing, and then things that increase stomach acid, like spices, would be harming if you already have too much stomach acid, right? Yeah, and I, I guess then too, um, no, that does make sense, just as you were describing it with the strong liver, you're not wanting things that are going to increase the bile production, going back to, as you stated previously, this is all about balance, and not taking anything out of balance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the, but the point is, we're already starting imbalanced. So we all have this imbalance where we are specialized in one area or the other. And so it's a choice. Do we do things that bring us back into balance or do we do things that exacerbate our imbalance? That's obviously the key focus. So the other type, just to clarify, so there's the kidney type. Oh, sorry. And one of the other things about the stomach type, let's just emphasize that. What does it mean to have weak kidneys? So in a practical sense, the most common thing is uh, hormonal issues. And specifically, they say for women, it's infertility. And for men, it's impotence. Um, erectile dysfunction, all of that kind of stuff. So kidneys are related to the sexual organs in that Eastern system. So you may not know how your kidneys are doing until you're quite far along in life, but a much early indicator for that is your fertility, your potency, and your hormonal health. So that's really how it shows up. So this is the most common type, apparently, for instance, to become monks or nuns. They just don't have as much of a sex drive. Maybe they're not able to have children. And so, you know, they often... Um, don't prioritize sex as much, basically. Um, so that, you know, can be an indicator. Now, of course, there could be other reasons why that's true for you, but it's just statistically, they have done a lot of statistic analysis on this and the people diagnosed as this, they are much more likely to have infertility. So that's that way that that weak kidney shows up. Now, we have the opposite types. The opposite type, weak stomach acid, strong kidneys. So how does that show up? Um, it will show up, obviously, as the opposite, good potency, good fertility, good sex drive, good hormonal health, um, hormonal being especially adrenal hormones and sex hormones, but weak stomach acid. So they tend to have the most finicky kind of digestive systems. The main thing is they cannot eat much. They often have to have very small meals and, you know, especially if they need to have a lot of calories because they're still very active or whatever, then they'd have to have small meals you know, very regularly throughout the day. Not 
to keep the blood sugar balance as much, it's not so much a hypoglycemia issue, though that can be a factor, but really because they literally can't handle much food at a time because they just have small stomachs. And again, see, this is what I like about this system. It's, it's very much based in physical reality. This is something that actually can be confirmed by an X-ray. Like, you can have an idea, or I, you know, maybe I have a large liver, or I have a large, large intestine or whatever, but an X-ray can confirm that. You know, you can actually see if it is big or if it is small. So we're talking about something that's an objective reality. We're not just talking about you have this energy or that energy, like something that's impossible to prove. These are based on physical realities which are verifiable. So that's what I really like about it. Um, and, of course, that it's actually helpful, as I said. So, um, yeah, the main thing with those is to eat a small amount of food. Now, everything that I just said, just like with the other pair, the opposite, right? So things that reduce stomach acid even further, like dairy, would be a really bad idea. Uh, things that increase stomach acid, like all the spices, the ginger, the peppers, the onions, all of that kind of things, would tend to be beneficial for this type. Um, so, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of shortening it a little bit, uh, but that would be uh, the, 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 simple, the simple way of looking at it. Um, so with these guys, in terms of the hot and cold, um, the stomach type, because they're still that carnivore type, still overall heat is good for them. That's the idea. And the kidney type, uh, because they have the strong kidneys, uh, the cold is still good for them. That's uh, you know generally what is uh, recommended. Now, other than the heat of you know outside you, another focus when it comes to temperature that's often there, including Ayurveda, is should you be eating warm or cold foods, right? And should you be drinking warm or cold drinks. And so um, this is another thing and another way you can perhaps tell which of these that you actually are. If you feel better um, drinking uh, cold water, then you are probably either the stomach type or you are the lung type. Uh, the stomach type, obviously, because the excess stomach acid the cold will dampen it down. That's the idea. Stomach acid is seen as something that's hot in Eastern medicine. Um, and then from the, the other type, the lung type, um, I'm not sure of exactly the, the reason for it, but that's what they say. And with the opposite types, it's the opposite. So the liver type and the, um, the kidney type, they're better off having warm drinking water. Uh, in the case of the kidney type, it kind of makes sense because kidneys is cold energy and so they're warmed up. And as I said, it does make sense to me as well. The liver type, the liver type is often feels cold. So not only are they better off um, um, getting warm from the outside, they also need warmth inside. So whether it's warm food, warm water, warm uh, uh, drinks... Um, so in a way, yeah, the liver type is the coldest type, so they need warmth from everywhere. And then the other type, it's, you know, it's kind of more variable. So the stomach type needs warmth from the outside, but cold on the inside. Um, the lung type needs um, warmth on the inside, but cold on the outside. And then the kidney type needs um uh, yeah, warmth from the inside and cold on the outside. Sorry, the, the lung type is the opposite. The lung type needs cold on the inside and um, warm on the outside. Right, okay, so there's... Sorry, oh. Oh, cold on the inside. <laughs> the lung type needs... All right, the lung type needs cold both. The liver type needs warm both. That's what it is. Sorry, I'm getting confused because I'm trying to memorize all this. And then the others are like one and the other. So... Um, with the stomach type, it's um, warm on the outside, cold on the inside. And with the kidney type, it's um, cold on the outside and warm on the inside. That's the difference. Um, and again, yeah, this makes more sense as well. Because if you have a weak stomach, then you want warm inside because it will, again, help to warm the stomach. Um, you might have noticed this, like if you've ever had a stomach ulcer or anything like that. I know you know someone who has, Chrissy. Um, often drinking cold drinks will set it off. Uh, that's because the stomach is already unhappy when you uh, pour cold on top of it. It just kind of uh, like aggravates it. Uh, but the idea is if you've not got to that terrible stage yet, um, if the problem is that your stomach is overactive, then the cold will actually calm it down. Whereas if the problem is that the stomach is weak, then it will calm it down too much and it will make it even worse. So that's uh, like a distinction. 
So again, is there full just scientific justification for these? No. The only reason I'm mentioning it is because it's another easy way of potentially diagnosing yourself. If you're like, oh yeah, I always feel bad when I have cold drinks, that can help you to narrow it down. Or I always feel better when I have warm drinks. You know, or I always feel better when I sweat. Or I always feel, you know, much more invigorated when I have a cold shower. These are like the only reason I mention them is because they could be really good indicators. And it seems weird that something like that would give you potentially like a blueprint about what you should be eating, but it's worth a try. It's wonderful. I mean, there's so much to really look at in, in a very in-depth way here. Um, a lot to look at and just for people to investigate because there's a, there's potentially a lot of information and, and sometimes it can be um, a bit overwhelming, but for anyone that's looking at it for the first time, just take a minute. Um, but, you know, it's definitely worth, worth investigating. Absolutely. And, you know, look into the subtypes as well. So yeah, I won't go through all of them, but the subtypes are just, you know, they're a cross between them. So, for instance, you know, one I know quite well is um, vesicatonia. So that's a uh, very weak stomach, but still quite strong liver. So that's kind of like an exception. It's not as common, but it's someone I happen to know has that. And as I said, that person, even though... They must have tried a dozen different body type diets and all kinds of diets and all the rest of it. This, again, is just the one that they stuck with because it's the only one that's actually accurate. <laughs> it's the only one that actually works for them. Um, and, yeah, there's been a few people, I'd say, where that's the case. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Beautiful, Ellen. So now that you've gone through really what this is, my next question is going to be, you know, how are they determined? Is it based on genetics? You know, what were the clues earlier when we were talking about? What are the clues and tendencies that you're actually seeing with people that are causing you to, you know, make this correlation of whether somebody's eating the right diet or not? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, how it's traditionally determined is through this pulse reading method. So I know that's very annoying in an online world because it literally means you have to go and see a practitioner in person and there are not many of them. I don't know if there's any in Europe. I know there's a bunch in America, but like in big cities where there is like a career town, <laughs> there's a career town, just in the same way there's kind of like a Chinese herbalist acupuncture place in pretty much every system in the city in the Western world that I've ever been to. Um, it's much less common to have a Korean place, but if there is a commu Korean community, then, you know, there may be one. But I've seen them in Australia, I've seen them in the US, but pretty rare outside of uh, Korea. I'll just go back to that Jap Japanese thing for a second. So one of the things that they say is, for whatever reasons, evolutionarily, a lot of Koreans um, are like the liver type uh, and sometimes also the stomach type, and so they tend to do well but more commonly, they're liver type. And so they tend to do well with this high meat diet often. And they do well with it. They eat more meat than almost anyone, and they live longer than almost anyone. But then there's the Japanese. Japanese eat very little meat. They eat a lot of, uh, in comparison anyway, they eat a lot of fish. Um, they eat a you know, fairly bit of uh, you know, seaweed and, and vegetables and stuff like that. And so for what they say, these experts in this system in Korea, is like a lot of Japanese people they meet are the lung type. And then a lot of Koreans are the liver type. I mean, obviously every community has both, but uh, there's kind of just a selection for this. And so it explains why, you know, they both have a very similar life expectancy despite having a very different diet. 
it's not necessarily that the you know Japanese diet is so healthy, which a lot of people suppose. If you think about like diets, a lot of people talk about how the Japanese diet is healthy, right? And how they live a long time and there's low rates of obesity there and all of that is true. Um, but the Koreans, you know, their life expectancy is only one year less. It's hardly, you know, terrible. It's way better than ours still, UK or US. And yet, you know, how many people are trying to emulate the Korean diet <laughs> in the Western <laughs> world? Um, it's not many, right? So there's this kind of bias, um, like a these days, like I would say throughout most of the history of the Western world, there has been a bias towards a, uh, you know, liver or stomach type diet in especially America. I'd say America and more stomach people, which is, as I say, they love those large portions uh, <laughs> and a large, you know, some variety of food. Um, but generally, you know, like it makes sense, like white people are going to come from more northern climates where there's going to tend to be less carbohydrates available and therefore they have adapted to more fat. It just kind of makes sense on a logical level. Um, as a generalization, of course, there are many, many, many exceptions. Um, but, you know, it's interesting how culture seems to have shifted. One of the things they say about the lung type of people is, first of all, they're very good speakers. They're very good orators because of the strong lungs. Um, and they're also got high levels of creativity and like they're good at leadership. And so I think as the world has changed to more of an information age, the people who um are good at being creative and good at speaking have had much more of a say at shaping popular culture over the last 50 years or so especially the last 20 years since you know the internet and the democratization of information where it's not just the one mainstream media with the party line and all the rest of it and so basically the kind of bottom line is what i'm getting at is a vegetarian diet is a hell of a lot more popular because those lung people um are very persuasive and convincing and when given free reign in the marketplace of ideas they actually do really well it's like before there almost was a bit of a conspiracy to keep the liver and stomach diet as like you know the primary diet and that's really shifted now and and again you know was it fair that 100 years ago a, a lung diet person you know like as a child they'd be forced to eat meat i mean and, and, and get very sick no that wasn't fair um, but I don't think we should go all the way to the other extreme now and go, oh, well, meat is evil, meat is wrong, and uh, meat is bad for everyone and all the rest of it. I think we just have to accept that there is this bio-individuality. Bio and uh, you could say, well, you know, despite that, Owen, I still care about the ethics of not killing and torturing animals, and I have a lot of sympathy for that position. Um, I will point out the only type of food that doesn't involve killing animals is maybe fruit that comes from trees so like a fruitarian diet maybe also dairy technically you're stealing animal food from an animal but you're not actually killing it so maybe dairy and fruit diet would be a diet that is like doesn't involve killing animals but every all agriculture involves killing a lot of animals so like it's all you're always killing animals if you're eating um and if you don't eat very much and if you think that's the way to deal with that like minimize how much you eat then you're probably that um kidney type <laughs> who has <laughs> uh, low stomach acid and is, has a you know a small appetite so yeah just accept that there are different types and remember one of the very famous vegan that i used to listen to i won't name him in case he's disavowed this quote since but um he said like he was a hundred percent like veganism is the way to go killing animals terrible and all the rest but he said there's nothing worse for the environment than an imbalanced human. And so he said some people do seem to need to eat meat, uh, to not to um, not to be healthy necessarily, but to be sane. And it's very interesting that he says that because one of the two liver types, the most common liver type, called a hepatonia, um, the main symptom that they get of their imbalance is actually not so much health issues in the way it's traditionally known. It's actually mental health issues. So it's depression, it's anxiety, it's even madness, hallucinations, schizophrenia, all of that kind of stuff. They often, in this system, they put down to a hepatonia, one of these liver types, who is eating the wrong diet. So if you think part of the problem of the world is there's too many crazy people who are in power, in positions of power, doing crazy things, ironically, it might be better to get them off their vegetarian diet and onto like a meat and potatoes diet, which really is a classic liver diet, like uh, red meat and potatoes, like beef and, you know, potatoes is like a quintessential 
uh, diet for those people and it might actually help them to act a bit more rational and sane and be a little bit less destructive to other human beings and destructive to animals and destructive to the planet. So what I'm saying is sacrificing the odd cow in the name of them not poisoning and bombing millions of us probably might actually be worth it even from an ethical point of view if you were to believe the system which i realize you probably don't if you're a militant vegan but anyway i just thought i'd say it um so what was the question <laughs> <laughs> great we'll, we'll bring it back around is really you know you, you did mention because i asked how the types were determined and you said it's by a pulse point which means you do have to go to oh, yeah. someone to a practitioner well, Yes, but let me finish that. Um, not everyone agrees with that. That's generally how it is taught. But of course, all the people saying that are the practitioners that you have to go and pay money to to get that diagnosis. If you look a little bit further afield, as I said, there's nothing in English, but I have sat through a bunch of education that is in Korean, Google Translate, subtitles, all the rest of it. Some people say, you know, there's other ways. One of the ways that they do it. So one of the things that this has in common with TCM well, TCM, and usually, even though it's a very broad system, it's basically, here, have some herbs and have some acupuncture. That's usually what it boils down to in the Western world, anyway. This system is similar. This is like, eat this diet and have some acupuncture. <laughs> it's almost the same. Um, and so they have a very different system of acupuncture. So what they say is, if you have a diagnosis and we do the acupuncture on you, um, if you feel worse, then it's the wrong one. So if you feel better, then it's the right one. So you can almost diagnose by treatment, which is actually surprisingly common even in the medical community, right? Someone comes in with infection, give them some antibiotics. Someone goes in with, let's say, you know, signs that they might have an infection, give them antibiotics if it works. Oh, they're an infection. If it doesn't work, oh, it's something else, right? So that's a pretty common way of dealing with things, even in the current mainstream medical world, and that's how they deal with it as well. Another version of that would actually be to have a best guess based on everything that you've learned in here and that you can learn otherwise, and I hope that other resources do come about in English, um, and, and follow that system really a lot, like at least 80%, maybe even 100% for a period, and see if you feel better or worse. And you may well feel uh, it, it's not 100% reliable. So I'll give you one example from my own experience. If you're someone who um has a strong liver with lots of bile production which in fact is me but for decades you've been eating a plant-based diet with lots of green leafy vegetables you may well be in a position of cholestasis and you may well be in a position where the bile is very toxic because it's been stagnant for so long and so when you start to eat a very different diet and you start to get that bile flowing you may not feel better straight away because you've got all this very toxic bile starting to flow. And this is, you know, what Dr. Smith talks about with toxic bile theory, how people often feel worse when they're following his diet of you know, beef and rice, beef and beans, whatever it is he specifically says. Um, so it isn't always as simple as that. Um, again, there were studies about this and uh, it's interesting. One, they, they looked at like people with specific diagnoses and then if they were and weren't following the diets and if they were healthier and if they lived longer. And what they found is they couldn't find a correlation in this specific study except for the people who were diagnosed as the two liver types, hepatonia and cholecystonia, when they broadly stuck to their dietary recommendations, they were substantially healthier and lived longer. So they, they couldn't see a correlation with the opposite, interestingly. They couldn't see a correlation with the lung types that if they stuck to their diets. I would... Uh, this is only um, theorizing my part, but I suspect even in this day and age where things have shifted somewhat, it's still pretty difficult to stick to a lung type diet 100%. Um, society really and culture and restaurants and all the rest don't make that very easy. Whereas it actually is very easy to stick to a, uh, a liver type diet. L literally McDonald's, you can go to any fast food outlet, the, the burger bun is liver type, the meat is liver type, the cheese is liver type, the fries are liver type, like everything about it. Like, so I think it's a lot easier to follow that liver type diet, even though I meet a lot of people who should be who aren't, but that's like a very specific, specialized situation. But I think it's easier to follow that diet. So I think that might be why. But at least there is evidence there that beyond statistical significance, 
um, people who were that liver type who followed that liver type diet pretty strictly were definitely overall healthier and lived longer. So I'll try and find the study to that and we'll put the link in there, Chrissy. But, that, you know, that was interesting. So, yeah, there are caveats to it. But according to lots of anecdotal evidence, so a lot of these doctors who do write about it, they share lots and lots of stories about healing people with these kind of diets. And what they say is, you know, they're kept, there often is an adjustment period, which is understandable for a month or two if someone hasn't been eating the right diet for a long time. But if they stick to this right diet for their type religiously, then within two or three months, they will usually start to feel significantly better. So if you're having a good guess that you might be one type. So that's one way of doing it. Another way to do it, and this is the more mm, controversial thing to say, but if you are suffering from a load of health problems, and this is the position I was in, if you are suffering from a load of health problems, this is the position I was in when I suddenly started to feel worse, you know, just uh, uh, around 40, and so you're not smoking, you're not drinking, you're not doing all those things that are supposed to be bad for you that a lot of people do, and you're eating a healthy-ish, at least, diet that's not heavily processed and fast food and junk food and all that, and you're still unhealthy and still suffering with this, that, and the other, and, you know, allergies and immune issues and all the rest are common examples of it because the immune system is heavily influenced by this, for instance, then that may be an indicator you're on the wrong diet for you. And you may want to consider something that's opposite. Now, what you like is definitely not a good indicator. Um, I love spicy food, for instance. Um, it's just not good for my type. And, you know, there's a lot of things that I do enjoy that I realized are good for my type and just for me in general, experientially. So that's, I'm not complaining, but that's an example. Spicy food, it does not agree with me. I already have high stomach acid production. I tried having, because I was listening to some practitioner who's well-meaning, like a stomach acid supplement, betaine hydrochloride, at the beginning of the year. Uh, oh, my God, did it make me feel, you know, not good. And I stuck with it too long again because I was trying to, you know, give it a chance and research and all the rest of it. And But it's the same response I get whenever I have too much acidic food, same response whenever I have these herbs and spices that increase stomach production is just not good so could there be other reasons for that yes there, there could always be other reasons for all these things but it's a good indicator and so we'll put a link to the food table here but there's a reason i haven't talked about everything i just talked about a few things right I talked about red meat green vegetables dairy you know root vegetables spicy food i think that might be all i've talked about in the area of food so these are some of like the the most obvious potential indicators. The spicy foods always irritate you. Um, you are probably not that um, low stomach acid type. Probably. Still possible, but probably not, you know. Um, if red meat always gives you issues, especially skin conditions and allergies and stuff like that, you're probably not that liver type. Um, if green vegetables always give you bloating and gas and discomfort and stuff like that, you're probably not the lung type, you know? Um, and if dairy usually gives you problems, then you're probably not the um, the strong stomach type. And there are always caveats and there are always exceptions and you might have an issue for it for, for another reason and all that kind of stuff. But these are like good indicators, um, I would say, is just like try the system. And I'd say try the system fully even not just the food, you know, if you decided that you're the liver type, try having a sauna or a hot bath or, you know, very long warm shower or whatever every day, try and make sure and, and you know, sweat and exercise until you sweat. When you exercise, wear enough layers that you do sweat if you don't sweat easily, like try and sweat. If you believe that you're opposite type, if you're the lung type, make sure not to sweat, you know, like get cold exposure every day. Like, do you see what I mean? Like, like try and stick to it fairly closely for a while and then see what your experience is. And, and I say a while, it always takes at least a few weeks to adjust to these things, even if they're 100% good for you. So usually two or three months is good. Obviously, if you start feeling terribly sick, you know, after three weeks, then you can give up there. I'm not saying to stick with it if it's obviously not working. But I'm saying if you're not sure if it's working, it's worth giving it like a good three months to be really sure. Yeah, I mean, I have to say when I was typed, um, you know, it, it was difficult to, you know, adhere. And I still don't fully adhere, but... Um, well, 
Chrissy, I mean, I saw that practitioner. He was totally wrong about me. That's right. Um, yeah. he, he saw me as something because I had been eating that way my whole life. And so to be fair to him, I, I, I did present as if I was that different type, but he was just wrong. And uh, he may well have been just wrong about you too. Uh, and of course, people, are, there are different qualities of practitioner. Some of them are very good, some of them are not. That one that you saw, yeah, when I studied more of the Korean literature, they said there is a common practice there of not accepting one diagnosis and you actually go and see two doctors and make sure, well, yeah, two in, in that culture and make sure that the two actually agree with each other. And if they don't, then, yeah, you might see a third or a fourth or something like that. And then there is also the experimental you know, part of it. Like just because someone tells you something doesn't mean it's necessarily the case. So if it's really difficult for you to stick to what you were told, it may not be. It may well not be right. That's the obvious conclusion I would come to. Yeah, that's a really good point and a fair point. It shouldn't be difficult. Like, it, it, it change can be difficult. So yeah, initially being that way is difficult because all of us are stuck in our ways and all the rest of it. But if after years you still feel like it's difficult to stick to, that's actually a good indicator that it's just not right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as well going back to you know previous episodes where we've talked about you know feeling satisfied with what you're eating as well. I really feel that that's a big part of it, and that was one of the things I was not finding with being typed in that way. So you know, but it's it, moving forward. It's about the awareness for sure. And it's not saying I'm not going to revisit the the different types and things and and potentially look at stuff. I'm just uh, you know going into it. Go ahead. But Maybe we could do it now for, for a couple of minutes to give a demonstration of the kind of questions that a person would ask. And we're not going to definitely diagnose you. We're just going to, you know, just be a thought experiment. So, um, you know, do you do saunas and heat or do you do cold and, well, first of all, do you do either of them? Let's Interesting. Yeah. No, I do both. So, okay. yeah. And which makes you feel better? Well, that's an interesting question to look at because, you know, what is better of trying to figure out what that is and, and, and feeling of it. I mean, of late, I've been doing more sauna, um, which, um, you know, I, cause I do like to sweat. I do like to, to move the, the body and, or not move the body, but move the energy, move the fluids that way. Um, yeah, I wonder what is, what is better, you know? And how, how, how big would you describe your appetite? Is it uh, medium, large, small? It varies, I would say, between, um, it's, it's, it, it, it tends to land more in the medium space. Uh, what's your favorite uh, like meal? What's the one that you would most enjoy, feel satisfied by? Well, I mean, for right now, because <laughs> I've been eating it a lot recently, um, chicken thighs, some halloumi cheese, and some black beans. And what's the least favorite? What's like really, ugh, I don't want to eat that. The like thin... And again, when I say least, when I say most of the least favorite, just for the people listening, I'm not talking about what you find tasty as much as like what is satisfying versus what is like, ugh, like disgusting kind of off-putting. Oh, that's a good question. Because I mean, I would have, my first initial response right there would have been just like a very simple white fish. But I mean, I've had... I've had that That's before. the least enjoyable. It's the least enjoyable, but I've had it in the past and, and been like, okay, with it, you know. But um, I think I'd be looking at like at that and going, oh, okay, <laughs> I, I have to eat that. <laughs> Cause and how do you feel? No, I was going to say, because I was also raised, um, you know, with, on steak and black beans and rice, you know, my mom's Cuban. So there was a lot of, a lot of meat in our family, <laughs> a lot of pork, a lot of meat. Um, yeah. So that goes also back to your point of like how you were raised, you were, you know, but that's different. I don't know. Um, yeah. What was your question? How do you feel when you have a lot of fat? <laughs> it's, like, it's really interesting because I enjoy the taste of it, but... It's not necessarily it. It doesn't leave me the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we know you have a good relationship with carbohydrates, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, from my genetic uh, reports. Yeah. From your genetic, and also in your experience, you handle them okay. Um, and do you have any food allergies or intolerances? No, not that I know of. I mean. Bread, a little, you know, I can tell it can kind of, depending on the combination, like if I'm going to eat like a really big uh, something with a lot of flour, it doesn't really sit so well with me. 
And you prefer, like, if, if it's something that you could have either hot or cold, would you prefer it to be hot or cold? Warm or cold? Uh, as far as food, I mean, I can eat, I can eat everything cold. That's fine. I mean, yes, it's nicer when it's warmed up, but I could still, you know, it's not a problem for me. Okay. But I, but I said, what do you prefer? Oh, uh, what so do I like prefer? Warm. Um, yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and drinks. I love ice water. Okay. And uh, spicy food? Mm-hmm. 100%. Does it agree with you? I think so. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You obviously don't have any fertility issues. You've had three wonderful, healthy children. Yes. Um, hormonally, you're pretty good because, you know, yeah, stuff. I think we talked about this before. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, I'm not qualified to diagnose, but just to give you an alternative perspective, um, the more I'm hearing, and there's also kind of personality stuff, so we haven't even touched upon the personality stuff, but it's yeah. something we have run out of time now, but it's, it's something I encourage people to look up. We'll provide a link again with a good website that gives some descriptions on that. Um, but I would say um, you, d you don't have strong enough opinions either way and feelings about fat and meat and greens and stuff for you to probably be in the liver versus lung category. I think, were you originally put in the lung category? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, you don't strike me. What What is your uh, athletic uh, endurance like? Can you run and run and run or? I mean, I can. I, my favorite race was the 400 meter and track when I was an athlete. But yeah, I would say I, I can, I can have, I have an, more endurance than being a sprinter. I mean, but I was, but when I played softball, I was fast on the bases. Like they'd, they put me into to, to steal bases and do stuff like that. So it's kind of like I'm sort of on both sides a little bit. Yeah, definitely less extreme. And of course, that's good. That's the whole point, right? Balance and health being, uh, you know, what's the word? Synonymous within this system and something to be reached. I know you are, you know, in very good level of health for someone your age, our age. So... You know, that's good and that would make sense. Um, extremes may be more interesting to talk about, but they're rarely actually uh, beneficial. Um, the, the more I hear it, I actually suspect that pr probably the thing that fits you most is the kidney type. Um, you said you don't um, have such an issue, though, that like you can only handle very small meals. And so there is this type called vesicotonia, which is in between a kidney type and a liver type. So they have that ability to, you know, happily digest red meat and beef and stuff like that because they have reasonably strong liver function. Um, and then they have, you know, reasonably weak uh, stomach function. Um, so therefore, spices, spices would be good for you. Um, and also just like in terms of... Uh, uh, chicken would be very good for that type. Uh, dairy, so long as it's warm, is good for that type. I think you like dairy. Um, uh, I think, yeah, um, cold is good for that type. So I don't know for sure, but I would say it's either that one or the one you originally diagnosed with. So, and of course, the whole system may not be true. I acknowledge that, right? This is just something to play with. Um, and you're, you know, you're not as obvious because you're not as dysfunctional. This is the problem. It's much easier to see with people who when you're are really, really out of balance. Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. are unhealthy. Um, so what I would do is look at that. And as you're already, as you said, doing pretty well, just look at the list of, you know, goods and bads and go, you know, like, is that fairly close to how I really feel? Um, like one of the indicators as well, like one of the things that's often quite like a remedy for those people is honey. How do you feel about honey? I really like honey. Yeah, so I, you know, and again, a while ago, it was really loving my Greek yogurt, honey, and a little bit of granola with some blackberries in the morning. Like I really enjoyed that. Yeah, honey is kind of a medicine for them. It's very stomach st strengthening. Um, the, the person who I was referring to earlier who has identified as this type for years, like when he was sick, which was much more frequent than you, he would literally, like he was like Winnie the Pooh. He would just sit there with a jar full of honey and a spoon and spoon it. And 
Like, who would have thought that would make you feel better because, you know, it's just a bunch of fructose and glucose, as we talked about. Like, um, scientifically, you know, Western science-wise, there's nothing in there that's particularly healing other than maybe from a repeat perspective of, you know, giving your body a quick source of energy and stuff like that. But, um, you know, but f for some reason, that would always make that p person feel better. So I've definitely seen that. Um, B vitamins are very good for that type, especially, um, they can actually handle a pretty, you know, broad selection of foods. Greens are still not great for that type, although it's not as important as for the liver type. Um, did we talk about greens? Are you okay with them? Yeah, I'm pretty okay with greens. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is something, um, and so unlike the other ones where they, um, so the, the the other kidney type, they really can't eat much and they have to eat like throughout the day because of how little they can eat. Um, because of the fairly strong liver of the the, the in-between type there, the vesicotonia, uh, they can have more. Um, like they can eat more and so they kind of, they are more in the middle. That's, you know, it's partly <laughs> your description there. Um, and uh, just looking... Yeah, so it's something, you know, you may want to just look at and see if you're already doing that. Um, if, you know, I know that while you are very healthy for your age, you still have some issues um, that we won't talk about. And so if you wanted to, I mean, not eating greens for a few weeks or whatever is not the worst in position, right? Um, or unless you're that type that you were originally diagnosed as, then it would be in <laughs> position. So, yeah. uh, you know, you could just try that. Uh, could try eating a bit more of the foods that are supposed to be like especially good for that type like you know honey some of the fruits apples mangoes stuff like that um definitely you know hot foods we talked about that's the type that that is best for spicy foods and all the rest of it and you know chicken uh so as you said chicken white rice beans spices honey fruit uh warm dairy and not other foods for a little bit and see if that and makes you feel see. better. Yeah. Okay. Good try it. Yeah, try it. I'll test it out for sure. No, it's been really good. Really, really good. And and obviously that's uh, just try it because you're not really suffering with anything kind of version of that. Um, the more the person is suffering, the more obvious it usually is that they're one extreme and, and you know, that they should perhaps try the other. So, yeah. Well, this is, again, even though I knew about this, this has been a great remembering, you know, walking back down it and bringing it to the forefront. And I'm glad that we're bringing it out to everybody. And um, earlier you touched on genetics. And so I just want to make sure that we're going over that because you did say, because we were just talking about being diagnosed and things like that, that it is um, passed down from the mother and father to the child. So I wanted to see if there was anything else in the genetics realm that you wanted to discuss here. Um, no, I don't think so. Just to say that there are studies on this. Oh yeah. I just wanted to mention one, one study actually. So as I said, you know, because this is a hereditary thing and, it, and this is a fairly recent system. I mean, this was created before they discovered the double helix immediately and stuff, but still it's kind of been developed along the lines of genetics. So there have been a bunch of studies and I'll include the links to one of them. They did a fairly big study on people with you know, opposite diagnoses and trying to find the SNPs that would relate to those organs, specifically the liver and the lungs, and seeing if there was a correlation there with SNPs. And um, when they used one particular method of analysis, they couldn't find it, but then they used a different method of analysis, and there was actually very striking uh, correlations there, which were interesting. So I'll include a link to that study as well. Bear in mind, there's a lot of these studies being done that are not being published in English, um, is my understanding. So, you know, the amount that are in English is is fairly limited. But, it, you know, again, it's interesting. I would say that I give more credence to this system than most for the reasons that I talked about right at the beginning. And it's interesting to see that I'm not the only one, that there is a bunch of people doing scientific studies on this, paying a lot of money. These are often, they're not small studies with, you know, a dozen people, they're large studies with hundreds of people, which you know, tends to cost a lot of money. Um, I can't see the vested pharmaceutical interest or whatever in doing these studies, which is usually required. So it does mean that there are, you know, a bunch of people who 
uh, do think that there is something to it. As I said, I've, as far as I'm aware, especially in Korea and Japan is where it is quite popular, which are both fairly affluent uh, countries and you know very long-lived countries. So if you find other studies that I am not aware of, please do post them below in the comments section. Uh, I think the research on this is fairly early and I do look forward and it to be honest, it may be years, don't, don't bug me about it, but I do look forward sooner or later to being able to have reports on the correlation uh, with this, with genetic insights, because uh, it can be a very useful tool. As you saw with Chrissy, the more healthy the person is, the more subtle it is. And look, just as a general rule, the healthier you are, the more you should probably just carry on doing whatever it is you're doing, <laughs> you know, whatever system it does or doesn't conform with. This is more in Korea as well, a system that is utilized to people when they're struggling, right, to try and understand why they're struggling and what they may be doing wrong and what might be a, a better alternative. Beautiful, Owen. And yeah, we'll definitely put the links uh, in the descriptions below. So make sure you check those out. And if you have questions, please leave them in the comments comment section. Let us know what you're thinking. Let me let us know if you thought this was valuable and if you're wanting to try it out. And please do remember to hit that like and subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. And we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe like the video, comment and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.